Good evening. My name is John Milburn. This is week one of Laws 11057, Introduction to Law for Central Queensland University, and this is term three. I'm joined by a number of students from this unit, and we have some guests from Contract A, most notably Dr. Amanda Jane George, who has joined us uh, for tonight's session and will be here next week as well. And AJ, as we affectionately call Dr. George, has allowed or has invited people to join her session in Contract A tomorrow night. So please, if you're um, studying Introduction to Law, consider taking up on that kind offer. So this is the platform that we use for our weekly sessions. This is Zoom, and I do record this session, upload it through YouTube onto Moodle, and uh, if you're not able to make the live session, please ensure that you watch the recorded session each week. It is important to stay on top of law in terms of the study. The workload is considerable and we do expect you to do your homework. Now, unlike school, homework is not something that follows the event. Here, homework proceeds and follows the task. And while you're engaged in the task, we want you to be active. We want you to be involved. And that might mean asking some questions, making some comments because we value your contribution. And it may mean making the most of the online platform, which may include undertaking some research in relation to what we're saying. So for example, as you're studying evidence in proof, um, which is a third year subject, we may be talking about the Evidence Act, oddly enough, in Evidence and Proof. And I think that if you're um, actively going to participate, you may want to be referring to the legislation as we proceed, perhaps making notes as we go, but asking questions and doing, doing so in a proactive manner. You see, a lot of things about law involve communicating in the use of your voice and your body language, but also active listening. So we're going to ask you to practice all of those skills as we proceed through tonight's session and beyond. So your text for Laws 11057 is a very good text. I hope that you've all received a copy. Hopefully, AJ, you've received your copy that I sent, but if not, it'll be there soon. And um, that's the text. So it is The New Lawyer, and it's an excellent textbook. Now, one of the good things about it is it's, light, it's fairly light reading. It's not a big textbook. So it only runs to 350 odd pages. You might say, oh, that's an awful lot. But in legal terms, that's not very much at all. But what it does is provide you with a map on how to go about studying law in a very practical way. So just at random, if you've got the text, please have a look. I've gone to page 222. What's section 222 is, uh, yeah. So that is an example of how you have figures, maps, flow charts, and problems to assist you in terms of active learning. So that's just an example. The book has many of those sorts of activities, flow charts, and uh, dot points. Not a big fan of dot points, but I think they have their place. And sometimes when you're undertaking some study, that's a good way to proceed. Look, um, you've got two lecturers tonight, as I mentioned. So briefly, some background from me, and then I'll ask AJ if she'd be kind enough to introduce herself as well. So I am, um, I've been a member of staff since 2012, um, sessional. I'm, if you like, from industry. So I'm a barrister. I've been a barrister for two years. I was a solicitor for many years before that. I commenced my study of law in 1977, finishing school in 76. And I've studied or practiced or taught or um, adjudicated in legal matters on a daily basis since then. So from my perspective, I can provide you with a lot of practical material um, as well as some uh, academic work. So that's a brief background for me, AJ. Okay, well, to reprise, um, I, uh, well, I actually started off as a legal secretary um, and uh, <laughs> I 
had a wonderful, wonderful um, partner that I worked with uh, for many years who was Thompson Simmons down in Adelaide. I don't know if you know the name, John. They've morphed into Thompson Playford. And I think they just go by the name of Playfords now in Brisbane. Um, <coughs> nice little firm. Um, and I had a great relationship with that partner. And then he gave me a kick up the bot bot and said, come on now, study law. It's something that you need to do. So I went and uh, I did my arts first at Adelaide. Then I ran up to, uh, well, half my arts, ran up to Adelaide. I ran up to uh, here and did um, my law degree at Bond and then uh, did some practice. Came back, uh, went over to London, did my master's, came back and started at UQ. Then I did my PhD and I've been in academe pretty much ever since then with, you know, pits and starts of practice as well. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it for me. Thank you, AJ. And over the next 13 weeks of this unit um, and your careers at uh, study, we'll get to know you much better as well and we do encourage you to engage with us. And thank you for doing that tonight. The focus of the unit, focus of the study is, if you like, towards practice. But the reality is that many of you, most of you will not practice as lawyers. That's just the reality of the situation. Don't let that dissuade you. And don't therefore think that it's um, irrelevant to think about the practice of law from a practitioner's perspective. Because when we're reading legislation, when we're reading cases, when we're talking about what law is all about, we will do it with a practical flavour, which means involving it from the perspective of practitioners. So the focus of the unit is for those who wish to practice law or perhaps engage with or instruct those that do. And when what you will notice about law is that it's not linear. Linear in the sense that we start at point A and we work methodically through a series of steps to arrive at B. There is a component of that, and um, we'll talk to you about the IRAC method of legal reasoning. It's an acronym, I-R-A-C. We'll talk about that later. That's an example of legal reasoning, and it might seem that therefore there's this linear process to resolving all legal problems, but there's not. You need to be creative and you need to think about different ways of resolving issues. Now, one of the best mindsets, I think, to adopt from the outset is this. It certainly works for me, and I use this all the time. And it's the method of thinking backwards. Looking to the objective that you wish to attain, what you wish to achieve, uh, thinking about the timeframes, and working back from that to reach your goal. That is part of the process of thinking like a lawyer. What it means is that the better that you prepare, the more likely you are to succeed, and the more likely you are succeeding, the less stress, the less panic, the less concern. There's a great quote in The New Lawyer, I think I mentioned this in the, in the lecture, at page 286 of this textbook, and I invite you to go and have a look at that if you've got the textbook, and it says, Thinking like a lawyer means keeping a cool and clear head and speaking and behaving rationally when others around you may be panicking or overreacting. Now, you'll wonder why I'm mentioning something from page 286 of the text in, in week one. Well, that's part of it. You see, the, the process of looking at a legal problem involves looking at the big picture first. So when you get yourself this, the new lawyer, or you've maybe got it already, I'd encourage you to not just start reading from page one in a linear fashion, but develop this skill of looking at the big picture and getting an overall view of what's involved and then drilling down from there. Then you can go back to page one once you've got an idea of where we're going. So that's an example, a practical example of what I mean by looking at the end result and then working backwards from there. We'll talk about that technique, that very technique in statutory interpretation. So those of you that are studying Laws 11059, and our first lecture is on Wednesday night, will hear me say that quite often. 
We'll do some statutory interpretation in this unit, but we have the entire statutory interpretation unit for you as well. And I'm sure that AJ will um, cover that in um, contract A and you'll hear it from others. So you think about the outcome that you wish to achieve. Now, let me give you a practical example of that. And from that, I'll then we'll, we'll look at Moodle and we'll think about what we need to achieve in this unit and we'll work back from there. Now, I need you to, I need to, I need to ask you a favour here and I'll just lower my voice. Um, I'm just going to tell you a story involving my wife and she, she doesn't like this. So just between us, if you would, and the rest of the world on YouTube. Let's take this scenario because it illustrates the point that I want to tell you. Um, and, it, and it talks to you, it gives an example of how things that you do incorrectly might cost you physically, emotionally, financially. Well, not physically, but here it is. So I'm at work, I'm in practice, I'm a, I'm a practicing lawyer. I'm extremely busy. I've got a number of things to do during the day. And my wife sends a text and says, look, I'm not well. Um, I, knew, I know I said I would do dinner tonight, but I, I just can't. Um, could you bring some takeaway? And um, what happens if you arrive home at 7 p.m. and you don't have the takeaway? Now, just picture that moment when you walk in. How do you feel? What's the cost to you? And I'm, I'm saying in terms of it, you feel drained, don't you? You think, I really, I've worked hard. Not happy, Jan? Yep. I've worked really hard, but I think it's not so much that your wife is disappointed in you, but you're disappointed in yourself because you let somebody down and you didn't want to let them down. So how did it make you feel? It made you feel deflated. Now, what should you have done in hindsight? At the moment that you got the call, what should you have done? Can anyone give me some practical ideas? Now, of course, this actually happened in about 1983, so things are different now. Okay, write a reminder note. Good. Order food to your home. Well, I couldn't do that back in 1983, but that's a good point. Order something. Ask for your secretary to order it. Set a reminder. Reminder notes. Okay. What if you prepare the reminder note the good old-fashioned way on a little piece of yellow sticker and you put it down and then the next day you arrive at work and you see that yellow sticker there, but it got buried under some documents. So that, that wouldn't work. Uber Eats. See, 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 the problem is technology is overtaking this story. Um, here's what I, uh, Benjamin has exactly said what I was thinking. Place it on your car keys. Okay, now that's good because you know you're going to take the car but what happens if you move the keys or the note falls off the keys? Let's just take it one step further. And what my suggestion is, when you get the call, place the keys right on your hand. That's a good one. Place the keys in the fridge. And I can tell you this from practical perspective um, has happened a number of times. I've gone to leave, couldn't find my keys. And then I thought, oh, they're in the fridge go to the fridge, why are they in the fridge? Oh yes, I've got to get takeaway. So what I'm really getting at, and you don't have to do that, but what, what I'm getting at is that you need to think about some technique that will assist you to ensure that you don't let yourself down. It's the same thing um, with court. So if, for example, you're at work and your partner says to you, please bring this affidavit of service to court tomorrow, it's important, we need it, and you turn up at court, you don't have the affidavit of service, it's sitting on your desk, how, do, how does it make you feel? How does it make you and your firm look in terms of um, professionalism with the clients? And it has a direct bearing on your stress levels so that if you don't have those precautions in place, if you don't do something from a practical perspective, then you may find that you suffer completely um, beyond the extent of the damage that's caused because you're so keen to do well and so responsible and so keen not to let people down that it really upsets you if you do that. So think about what you're going to do um, and prepare work backwards. Now with that in mind, I'm going to share the screen, ask you to look at the Moodle site. If you've got Moodle in front of you, please do so, have a look at that, but I'll put it up on the screen 
And with any luck, you can now see the landing page, as I call it, to Moodle. This is for introduction to law. So the first thing that stands out to me on that page is the top left-hand corner assessment. So in light of my thoughts of you need to work backwards, it seems to me that the first thing you should be looking to do, if you haven't already done it, is ensure that you're aware of the assessment regime, be acutely aware of the dates, and be aware of the consequences. So let's look at the third, assessment number three, briefing paper, which we also call a take-home paper. That will be released at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, 5 February 2019, and you'll see that it's due Wednesday, 6 February 2019 at 11.45 p.m. So for that take-home paper, you have about 29 hours. Now, what um, can I expect you to do? Well, certainly to diarise those dates. Make sure that you are, to the extent possible, free during that time. You don't have to be free all of that time. The idea of the take-home paper is that you don't have to sit an invigilated examination instead of it. An invigilated exam is paper, pen, open or closed books at an exam centre with a two hour duration. Now, we, we did have that introduction to law and we'll probably go back to it in introduction to law, but this term, this unit, you've got a take home paper. So instead of having three hour commitment to do the exam, you've got 29 hours, okay? But please make sure that you do it within that time because, and here's the catch, if you don't upload your briefing paper, by 11.45 p.m. on Wednesday the 6th of February, then there is no provision for late assessment and you will get a nil mark. The only exception to that is if you successfully apply for special circumstances through the Deputy Dean of Teaching and Learning and you probably don't want to take that risk. So I would suggest that you make sure that you upload your paper by that time. Now, there's no point clicking on that link to have a look at the paper because it's not there. And the reason is that it will be released. I will release it uh, at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, the 5th of February. Let's have a look at the one above it. Assessment 2, due on the 17th of January. And this is a little different because it says, cut off on Saturday, the 26th of January, 2019 at 11.45 p.m. What that means is that the assessment is due on 17 January. But if you're late, you can lodge late up until the cutoff, which is Saturday the 26th of January. After that, there's no, I'm not accepting any papers. The penalty for late submission is 5% per day. So rather than lose 5%, submit on time and um, uh, you'll get a better result. Assessment one is due on the 29th of November at 11.45 p.m. And this is the only one where, during in-term assessment that I do, where there's no cutoff, but you will lose 5%. Okay, any questions so far about the assessment regime? Um, and I'll stop the share. And of course, AJ, if you have any comments, please, please feel free to contribute. All right, any questions, comments? Reiterate, um, planning. Planning, 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 planning. Um, John has absolutely started at the right end of the, the track for you guys. The sooner that you get into the habit and start, oh, you've just got a quick question in relation to the assessment there. Um, but the sooner you start setting good habits for diarising the crucial dates for a term, the, the better off you will be. And the, the principal thing to remember is if you're not generally speaking a planner, um, then plan to plan. That is, I, I actually recommend uh, that my students look at um, reminder apps and uh, time management apps. Okay, so if you've got to plug that stuff in somewhere, get it locked away, get it done in that first crucial week of term. So it's almost like a set and forget. Do you know what I mean? You can, you're, you've got reminders set for yourself. You've got the car keys in the fridge. You're ready to go. Okay. Thank you, AJ. Um, to answer a couple of questions, Tim Timothy says, how long is the briefing paper expected to take to complete? 
probably if you are well organized, you know, three hours, uh, maybe four hours, but um, some people take longer, some people may complete that in a shorter time. Um, any other questions? Um, when I mention time, um, just be careful I'm talking about, if you like, Queensland time. So please make the adjustments for daylight saving or for if you're interstate or overseas, make those adjustments. So um, I'm always talking Queensland time in the times that we've got. Timothy says, are we allowed to sleep? Well, when I did the bar practice course two years ago, which is like boot camp for barristers, in the first day of this six week unit this course, they, um, one of them came in and said, look, um, when I did this a few years ago, I averaged three hours sleep per night for the entire six weeks. I thought that was a joke. I um, was one of the better ones and I averaged about five hours for that six week period. But um, yes, you are allowed to sleep, but you know, make sure you get your work done too, um, is the short answer. All right, so thank you very much for that follow up. Now, in terms of what work needs to be done for the first assessment, I'd urge you to look at some material. The first assessment for those of you that are involved in any form of IT will find this very easy. What you need to do is prepare a professional portfolio. And this is an online portfolio. Prepare it in Word version first, and um, we will set up an email account for you through Google. It's not done yet. So don't try to submit the work yet. Maybe leave it go for a week or two. Um, it's due week four on the Thursday, the 29th of November, but don't try and submit for a couple of weeks until we get the email accounts. I don't get the email accounts set up until we've got the numbers have settled, if you know what I mean. In the first week or two, some people coming and going. But what your task is, is to prepare a portfolio, prepare it in Word. You don't need a lot of words. I don't want a lot of words, partly because a lot of words means that I have to do more marking, which I don't want to do necessarily. But here's the real reason. What you're looking to do is prepare a skeleton for the portfolio that you can use throughout your entire studies and into your career. You can use this as a marketing tool. So for those of you not familiar with a portfolio, for want of a better term, it's like a CV on steroids. It's um, where you can put in some videos, you can put in some artifacts, you can put in some links to work that you've done, you can put in some documents. So it's an online presence that is real and should serve you into the future as well. There is a, an entire unit on this. Um, Associate Professor Scott Beatty does um, a professional portfolio unit. So it's a precursor to that and um, it will serve you. So the idea is that you create this skeleton in the first four weeks. You dress it up with some of the mandatory things that we want to see. You put it in a format that works for you. Do that in Word first, and then, we'll put it, you, then you put it online into Google and build on it progressively. Now, beyond doing the first assessment, it's up to you then to continue to build it, but keep that in mind in terms of the portfolio. Tim says, would you use this portfolio for a real job application? Absolutely. Yes. So um, um, it's meant to be practical and Google are providing this for free. So it's not costing you anything, um, but it's something that is of lasting and real value. It's also an opportunity for you to develop your IT skills. Um, it's accessible after your degree. Absolutely. You get to keep it. Um, permanently. So well, at least that's what I'm told. Um, so if things change, I'm sorry, but that's the, that's the current idea. Um, it's also an opportunity for you to develop your IT skills. After all, you're doing an online unit or online degree. So one of the things that you want to be able to say at the end of it is, um, I have much better IT skills than I had at the start. Now I know that there will be many of you out there that are better at IT than I am. And I know that some of you will be willing to assist others, and I'm counting on you. I'm now asking you if you're good at this stuff, if you're able to assist others, please do so. Which leads me neatly into this idea of collaboration. Not collusion, collaboration. So collaboration is developing a collegiate atmosphere. 
collegiate in the sense of we're in this together. We're all in this together. Um, I want you to help me. I want to help you. And I especially want you to help each other. Don't get hung up on marks. Bear in mind that we're not constrained by a bell curve. We can give out and everyone can get a HD theoretically. So help each other. It's really important. And if you've got tips, please share that. I used to use a thing called Ucrew. So if you're looking at old videos, you'll hear me talk about Ucrew, which was a communication platform. We don't use that anymore. So use the Q&A um, section or um, uh, discussion forum, probably more likely to help each other. Any questions then about the first assessment or my initial thoughts on collaboration and if you like the difference between it and collusion? Any questions? So collaborating is where you're assisting each other. Collusion is where you are, if you like, involved in plagiarism, um, where you're not using your own words, where you're not using your own work to produce something. And speaking of plagiarism, part of your first assessment requires you to consider a case which is useful because it deals with issues to do with plagiarism relevant now in the context of someone who applied for legal practice, practitioner status and how the things that might happen in week one or year one can come back potentially to haunt you down the track. So it's important you understand your ethical obligations and some of the consequences if we don't do things correctly. Any questions or AJ, do you have any comments that you wish to add? All good? Okay. So that's the first assessment. The second assessment is a toolkit. Again, very practically orientated, something that works for you. And the idea of um, the toolkit is that you develop, if you like, strategies, skills, techniques, links um, to work towards completing the break, the take home paper in the allocated time. So that's the assessment regime. Now I'm just going to share the screen again, have a look at the Moodle, what I call the landing page. If you talk about, if, I, if you hear me talk about the landing page, this is it. Other coordinators, lecturers may call it something different. So top left hand corner, we have assessment regime. Click on that link, it will take you to the assessment. And from there, you upload your assessment. Now, if I click on the link, and I'll do this for the second assessment, what you see on my screen will be different, I think, to what you see on yours. So there's the assessment, but it's also produced in Word version. There's some also some uh, videos to assist you. I, I said Word version, it's a PDF. So the written material above is contained within this PDF document, if you can see where my cursor is, down towards the bottom. Now on my screen, you'll see that it says there are a number of participants and I have an opportunity to view the submissions and grade the, the work. But your screen, I think, will say something to the effect of, here's where you upload your work so that it then comes through to me. Upload your work, please, at least for me, where possible, <clears throat> in Word version rather than PDF. It'll save me having to convert it. Um, and just a word of warning, any work that you submit goes through a thing called Turnitin, which is a, an anti-plagiarism program. And it's important you understand this, and I don't want you to be scared by it, but be aware of it. Um, when you submit your work, the university will, through the Turnitin program, automatically have access to all materials, relevant materials on the internet, including past papers, and the Turnitin program can identify very clearly where there is a match with other work of any sort and will identify that work for me. It will give me percentage numbers um, and it gives me an opportunity to detect whether there might be any plagiarism. Please be aware of that. Now, if as a result of submitting your work, you find that there's a plagiarism score, which is very high, and I need to stress this, don't be overly concerned just because of the number. That doesn't necessarily mean that you've committed some form of plagiarism. It may be, for example, that you are quoting appropriately and appropriately referenced from legislation or case law or some other source, a secondary source. 
pr the main idea is to ensure that if you do refer to or quote or copy, if you like, material that you have appropriately referenced it. Um, what we don't want is for you to pass this work off as your own. Do you see the difference? And it's a huge difference. So in your textbook, all legal textbook and cases, there is reference to external materials. You see it in cases all the time. Judges will refer to legislation. They might even quote legislation. They'll refer to other judgments and they might quote from those judgments. But the, uh, the, the, the judges don't pass it off as their own work. They say, I adopt and accept or I use the words of his honour or her honour, such and such in this case, and maybe even reproduce a paragraph. That's not plagiarism. That's just appropriately referencing the work that you refer to in your, your own material. I hope you see the difference there. If you have any issues, please discuss it and we can talk about it. Yes, yes, AJ. I just have a quick uh, thought bubble to add there, John, and that is um, I served on the QUT Misconduct Committee for some years and um, I just want to make join the dots for you guys in case the dots haven't already been joined and that is there is a definite link between failing to plan for your assignments and failing to leave enough time for your assignments and plagiarism often not always but often and particularly in first year and i'll tell you why because students that leave it to the, the night before and they're running out of time to submit and as John has just explained to you, the ramifications are fairly severe if you don't submit on time, okay? You will be feeling a lot of weight and pressure on your shoulders if you get to the night before and you haven't started preparing. And that, unfortunately, is when a lot of silly decisions get made as to can I cut and paste large slabs of something that I've found on the internet that looks roughly like the assignment I have to do. Or even worse, ringing up your friend that's done um, intro to law last term and gone, you know what, can you help me out here? And trying to copy some of what they have done. Okay, that's not on. And, you know, don't force yourself down that track is all I would like to add because that's when, you know, that's when these silly kinds of errors, you know, start to bubble up to the surface. And the other thing, I, I didn't um, catch the very beginning of, of that, um, uh, like just before you started to go into your assessments, John, but, um, you know, the, the consequences of academic misconduct are very grave. And um, nowadays, when you're going for your admission, um, if you do have open, if you have cases of academic misconduct on your record, um, that will not bode well for you when you're trying to get admitted. So don't shoot yourself in the foot now at this early stage of the game. Okay, that's the only other, that's the only other thing that I would. No, thank you very much, AJ. And um, in that first assessment in the portfolio, as I mentioned, you need to consider a case, and this was the case of Humsey Hancock. I'm pleased to say that everything worked out well for Mr. Humsey Hancock. So we're happy to, to use his unfortunate circumstance as a learning opportunity for you. But I totally endorse those comments from AJ. It's really important, and it comes back to planning. Now, you need to be prepared. In the spirit of looking at something in your book towards the end and working backwards, have a look at page 346 of The New Lawyer, if you would. And in the context of, I think it's 346. Now I'm, now I'm starting to doubt myself. Yeah. Learning, no, I'm sorry. I, I may have... Um, the wrong page number there. So I'm just going to read this quote to you. My apologies. I'll update my material. Learning self-management skills at law school is important if you are to ensure that you maintain good psychological health during and after your legal studies. For example, a study led by Catherine Lay says 955 students at University of Adelaide and found that 58% of law students were psychologically distressed. This was the highest level of distress recorded across disciplines. Medicine was next at 44%. 
The study shows that there are special issues for law students and emphasises the need for students to take particular care of their psychological health. I think I mentioned that also in the formal lecture. The reason we say that is not to dissuade you or scare you, but to reinforce the need to be prepared and to understand the level of stress that you will find yourself in as you study and in practice. Now it's manageable and it can be a lot of fun. I mean, for example, I've, as I said, I've been doing this since 1977, pretty much every day. And I can guarantee you that every day I learn something new and something's different. So there's a whole lot of variety out there for you to practice in or to study in law. It's not a closed area at all. It's very broad. Um, in terms of legal practice and legal thinking, I just want you to be aware of the plain language skills phenomenon, or sometimes called plain English. When I started, it seemed that lawyers embraced the concept of using the longest, most convoluted words and sentences within the most detailed paragraphs possible as a way of, I don't know, impressing, but it wasn't, it was never readable. Um, a lot of repetition, a lot of unnecessary words, um, words that were just not understandable unless you had a dictionary. I don't know if any of you have read Stephen Fry, but I've never had to go to a dictionary more than when I have when I've read Stephen Fry's work, but it is his good work. Um, so plain English drafting. So communicate simply and effectively is the message. I'm going to give you a tip here that you can choose to accept or um, adopt if you wish. And that is, where possible, if in doubt, use short sentences. Also, if in doubt, write in the active voice. Lawyers delight, it would seem, in using the passive voice and using long sentences. Sometimes you can get away with it. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes it is necessary to write in the active or passive voice, but oftentimes it is unnecessary. Writing in the active voice is far more direct um, and usually provides more information. We'll talk more about that later, but do start to think about those issues of potentially short sentences and active voice. The idea is that you write professionally and communicate effectively. What I notice is that sometimes people provide responses to our questions um, with very lengthy paragraphs convoluted sentences, many concepts, um, and it just doesn't work. Now, skilled writers can do that, and quite often skilled writers will vary the pace. A short, sharp sentence, and then there might be a flowing sentence. I mean, that can be a lovely style. So using all short sentences can become quite disjointed and off-putting, but it's a safer way to go. When you're studying law, take note of how people write. Not so much um, historically, but more um, of the modern style. So the new lawyer you know, is, is a, a document where the authors have written in a modern style and it's very effective. Now, what about the study of law generally? Um, let me get something straight. You will not know all of the law. Doesn't matter how long you practice, doesn't matter who you are. So you will not know all of the law. Because, and part of the reason is that it's very, identify, very difficult to identify what is the law because it moves and it's subject to different influences. I mean, so you won't necessarily get the right answer for any given legal problem. We're not really interested, you might, and this might surprise you, we're not really interested in the final answer. It's not a maths quiz. It's not a physics or an engineering type exercise. We're looking at a legal problem. We're mostly interested in your ability to think in a legal manner and to know where the law can be found or where you can find the law and then apply the law in a certain way. I hope that makes sense. And let me illustrate it this way. As you're doing, you're undertaking your reading, you'll see some high court decisions. And in a constitutional high court decision, you might see that the court was split. Split meaning some judges went one way, other judges went the other way. Now, if you have, say, a 4-3 split in the high court, 
you cannot say that those three in the minority don't know the law and don't know what they're talking about. It's just that they have ultimately come to a different conclusion. So does that explain a little while as to why the final conclusion isn't necessarily that important? That doesn't mean a split personality, no. It means going to different sides. So um, what we want you to do is to think about how you find the law and then how you interpret it and apply it before you come to your conclusion. And next week, we'll talk more about the IRAC method or variations of that, which is where you identify the issues, which is the I, the rules, which is what the law is, which is the R, the application of that, which is the A, and C, of course, is the conclusion. So we'll talk more about that later. But I just want you to start thinking like a lawyer in terms of trying to identify what are the issues, what are the rules, where do I find the rules, what are the rules, now how do I apply them in order to come to my conclusion. So the study of law is, it's fluid. There is, it changes all the time in different ways. So <clears throat> let's use this example. But now I'm going to use the court of mum and dad here, but it applies equally to the court of mum and mum or the court of dad and dad. But for simplicity, let's just talk about the court of mum and dad. So go back to your formative years when you had to face the court of mum and dad. Something happens and you get in trouble. And your thought is, well, I didn't know I did anything wrong. Nobody told me. I just got in trouble out of the blue. That's not very fair. So the court of mum and dad develops and then some rules get written up on the fridge, don't they? So the rules are number one, number two, number three. So now we have some rules there and you get in trouble again. And you say, yes, but the rule says this and I was doing something slightly different, so I shouldn't get in trouble, in which cause the, the, now it becomes the court of mum and dad say, well, we've considered the rules, we've seen what you've done, and we've come to this conclusion. Do you see what I mean? So you can see that, if you like, in, we have mum and dad, uh, in this instance, parliament. So they have created some rules and they've written them down and said, one, two, three, here are the rules. Then, when we're trying to consider certain facts within the context of those rules and we're arguing about it, that's like the court of mum and dad, isn't it? And um, so mum and dad are now making a decision based on the facts and coming up with a conclu conclusion. And you might then use that decision at a later time. Well, yes, but Last week, Dad told me that was okay. So that's like a precedent, isn't it? You're arguing a precedent. You're saying, in the court of mum and dad last week, this is what happened. So now that's what should happen here, shouldn't it? So we call that, that's like a precedent. Do you understand what I mean? It sounds like a six-year-old, yeah. Um, so in that little example, what I've tried to create is a mindset where you understand that parliament creates laws and they get written down. Courts consider the laws, but they consider them within the context of a case, come to a decision, and create some precedence. Now, of course, it's inherently unfair, isn't it, that we have mum and dad both as parliament and as the court system. I mean, that's just not fair. So we have a separation, don't we? So in our system, Westminster system, we have a separation between parliament and the courts, and who knows what the other one is? Parliament, courts, and there's three. Starts with E. Executive. Thank you, Gary. Yep, the executive. So Parliament, if you like, creates legislation. We'll also refer to them as Acts of Parliament, ACTs. Capitalise the word Acts if, if in that context. Um, courts, of course. Um, and when I say courts, it, courts and tribunals. And the executive is, if you like, the government um, which implements and monitors and deals with those laws that are created by parliament. 
in a practical way. So if, for example, Parliament makes some laws about fisheries and they need to be implemented in a practical sense, then I don't know. Do we have a Department of Fisheries? I, maybe we do. I don't know. We have a Department of Fisheries. So the Department of Fisheries is the executive and the um, uh, department then deals with applications, deals with infringement notices and deals with those, if you like, executive powers. So can you see that distinction between Parliament and the courts and the executive? Now, of course, mum and dad purport to be everything and that's just not fair. So in real life, we have a separation between them. What if the courts say one thing and Parliament says another thing? Which is more important? Which one takes priority? Quick poll out on your keyboards. Is it the Acts of Parliament or is it the courts? So we're getting some votes in now. Parliament, 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 Parliament. Yep. And I think that that is right. So always the acts will overrule, the acts take precedent over the courts with one exception. And then that's to do with constitutional matters. So if the High Court deals with an act and says that act is invalid, etc., that it's not unconstitutional, then that will mean that the courts can strike out the law. But otherwise, if you have a law that is created appropriately, validly, it will take precedent. But what happens is that we create a law and you can't deal with all circumstances. So, for example, someone says uh, a law is created saying, I don't know, um, you, you must take pay attention when you're driving. Someone's in an accident and police say, what happened? Well, I just looked down for a moment I was, and I changed stations on my radio I'm showing my age now but on my radio and I just I just momentarily does that mean you're not paying due care and attention um, and you know or if you do something else so you can see how laws are created but they can't cater for every circumstance otherwise the law books would be enormous so for any given circumstance a dispute may be determined the courts may determine the dispute now the the courts may make a decision about something and say, well, yes, but that law doesn't mean um, that you that that law is not intended to stop people from changing a radio station. Parliament might get word of this and say, no, we don't like that court decision, so we're going to change the law. We're going to amend the law to make it very clear that if you change radio stations, that is a breach. So that amended law overtakes the earlier court decision. Oh, I hope that makes sense. Does that all make sense? We're getting some nods? All right. So you can see it's fluid. Parliament creates a law. The parties and lawyers have a dispute in court. Courts interpret it. Even then the judges may agree or disagree. There might be appeals. Then Parliament says, no, we're going to create some new laws. And, um, and then we have an election. We have a new Parliament comes in and they change everything. Um, you'll notice that there's some terms here, Parliament, Government, the Crown. The Crown's an interesting one. Does anyone know what the Crown is? Have you heard of that? Have you read about the Crown? You often see it in criminal law cases, the Crown against somebody. Crown, if you like, is, I don't know how to describe it best, but it's sort of like the household. In the context of mum and dad, you have mum and dad, um, you have the members of the family, but the crown is sort of who's in the household at the time because people can come and go and things like that. Like the state, yes. So the state, not a crown, that you, it's not a tiara, but yeah, it's, um, that's the crown. All right, I know I've been doing a lot of talking. Does anyone wish to say, make a comment? Because you're allowed to make comments here or ask a question or AJ may have something that she wants to add. No, I thought that was a great analogy um, <clears throat> in terms of the court of mom and dad. I thought that was brilliant. Um, <laughs> I think I may have to shamelessly borrow from that in my own tutorials. Um, but that, folks, is the reason why you never, ever in your entire lifetime know the law. That is, in your brain have a drawer that deals with every law, that's on the statute books because it's always changing. 
And um, law doesn't change, generally speaking, um, law doesn't tend to change super quickly, but there are always movements going on in every single area of law, even contract law. I mean, contract law probably moves slower than most area areas of law, but you know, every now and again, you'll get a rush and you'll get the high court granting, you know, leave to appeal on a number of different areas and then you'll just have massive changes. So really it's, it's a case of horizon scanning. You know, you've got to develop those skills. But um, as John was saying, the crucial thing is to know where to go to find the information. That's, that's the key. And, and there are skills that you have that will take you through. The law will change around the edges. What, what doesn't change is your skill set. You know, you'll take that same skill set through. And if you know where to go to find the information that you need quickly and efficiently, your life will be made much more livable. Absolutely. So we have some great resources here at the university, paid resources. So please take an opportunity this week to go to the university online library, make yourself known, um, perhaps to librarians, and do some investigation. We all have our favourites, but I think LexisNexis is great. Thomson Reuters Westlaw is great. Some people really like CCH. So there's some paid resources, and they're very expensive resources, available to you. There are also free resources, and these free resources should not be ignored. The fact that they're free to the public does not mean that they're of uh, little value. There's some excellent resources. You will get to know um, the official legislation science for Queensland legislation and Commonwealth legislation. Commonwealth level, it's the Federal Register of Legislation or the registration, um, the legislation register. Um, also, Austly, A-U-S-T-L-I, paid resource, part of a global network. It is absolutely fabulous. If you look into Austly, go to Queensland, go to Queensland Acts, choose an act, I don't know, the Property Law Act, choose a section. You may have to go to a couple to find this. And on the right-hand side, click the button that says note up and you'll be amazed because what it does is it identifies relevant cases to that section. So part of your legal research has started already. So when you read, you know, I mentioned the court of mum and dad, the rules, one, two, three, what Osley will do for you is identify the legislation. It'll state it, then go to the right, click note up, and it will show you some of the important decided cases that better um, explain and illustrate that section in operation. Another personal favourite of mine is Jade, Jade Barnett. It's a great free resource. It has a wonderful citator. Citator is what I've talked about with NoteUp, and uh, it's a valuable resource. So you'll need to get to know these for Introduction to Law because you'll need to include some of these in your toolkit. Your toolkit is your document, this is assessment two, your document that you use in a practical sense to um, deal with legal problems. Okay, now beware of the simplistic answer. As you develop your skills and experience and your confidence, you might start to get to a stage where you say, I know that this is the answer. And it may well be, but just be careful of simplistic answers. Do we have any conveyances with us in this unit? Any conveyances here? So I'm going to say some nice things and some not so nice things about conveyances right now. Mostly nice. What I'll say is this. If you want to be a really hardworking legal practitioner who has a lot of responsibility, um, conveyancing should not be ignored. It is a tough area of practice. And those people that work in conveyancing, I think do a wonderful job. But sometimes can be a little bit one-eyed in terms of the advice in that when you're doing conveyancing, you're looking at the contract, you're looking at the property law, you're looking at the land title act, um, and maybe not thinking about other things like torts law or consumer law or constitutional law. So just be a little bit careful, even though in this degree, we will teach you, AJ will teach you all about contracts, um, 
and then you might learn about criminal law, then you might learn about torts law. You've just got to be remember, of course, that we're doing our best to break it up for you. But in reality, all of this is part of a global area of practice. So you need to be creative and you need to think laterally. I'm going to invite you to do some homework, which is good homework to do. It's not in the um, it's not part of the textbook. This is just something that I think you should do. And that is, I'm going to ask each of you now to think about the best legal movie or book that you have come across that you think your colleague should either watch or read, as the case may be, and just choose one. We'll, we'll list some names. So I could ask you to indulge me. Ah, yes, the castle, says AJ. The Good Wife. I haven't seen The Good Wife, but I, Suits. A lot of people say Suits. I've never seen it. I'm aware of it, but I haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> um, how to Get Away with Murder. I don't know. Oh, Few Good Men. You Can't Handle the Truth. Liar, Liar. That's good. Erin Brockovich. Excellent movie. Liar, Liar. Making a Murder. Um, I'm going to add In the Name of the Father. 12 Angry Men. Oh, that's a good one because I use that in both Evidence in Proof and in Alternative Dispute Resolution. Magnum Force. That sounds good. The Man Who Sued God, Billy Connolly. Uh, Legally Blonde. Excellent movie. Sometimes underrated, but really very good for evidence. The Firm. That was scary. Um, LB2. I, I think I've seen that. To Kill a Mockingbird is a is a... Uh, a very good one in terms of courtroom drama. Um, I think uh, Promised Land is uh, one that I've come across for environmental law, which is really good as well. Another one, My Cousin Vinny is really good and it shows the importance of carefully considering the evidence before you. A lot of you may not know My Cousin Vinny. It's an older movie, but Joe Pesci, Marissa Tomei, excellent. So some good suggestions there. And um, the reason I'm asking you to look at this to, to do this is partly for inspiration, but also to think about how you now view movies and books from a legal mindset, because it's different. And you'll notice this as you're undertaking your reading, I want you to think about how this might be used in practice. And by looking at a movie, reading a book, it gives you an idea of how to do that. Um, other things are you might think about life in a slightly different way. So you might come across an, an instance where you think, well, that's not fair, but tell me, why isn't it fair? And start to think like a lawyer and think, well, what can I do about it if it's not fair? So it's all part of the legal mindset that we're encouraging you to start to develop now. Okay, um, during the unit, during your study, You'll use different platforms. You'll use different modes of communication. You have the advantage of the online platform, which means that we are using different technologies. I want you to embrace those. And as I mentioned earlier, to share those technologies with each other. I do want you to start looking for the law. Do that this week. I've mentioned a few platforms. You do need to go into the legal library, the CQ library, find your way around and just spend some time enjoying the process of discovery. Have a look at some of the free legal platforms and start to learn some of the tricks. Um, there are many ways that you can improve your studies, but largely, I hate to say it, it comes down to you. There's not much point in me just saying, or AJ saying, look, go and have a look at this legislation. You need to, you need to discover some of this for yourself, and that's part of the joy of it, to do that. We've got some great resources for you. Um, it's not, I'm not going to point you specifically, but I want you to look very generally. And I want you to think about the threshold learning outcomes. And, um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up and hand over to AJ. But when you're studying your law, think of it this way, that there are six threshold learning outcomes identified by your authors that you need to, to consider. Now, here they are. Number one is knowledge. Number two is ethics and professional responsibility. Number three is thinking skills. Number four is research skills. 
Number five, communication and collaboration. And number six, self-management. Now, before you started this unit, before this tonight, I suspect that if you wanted to, if you were asked about what's involved in being a good lawyer or a good law student, you would say, well, knowing the law is the important thing. But what we've identified tonight is it's one of six and you need to consider them all. Knowledge is one of them and we've talked about that tonight. Number two, ethics and professional responsibility. We've covered that tonight as well and the importance of understanding it starts tonight for all of you. Number three, thinking skills. How do you think like a lawyer? We've covered that. Number four, research skills. You've got your homework to do. Number five, communication. We've talked about that. And collaboration, the fact that we're all in this together. And number six, very important, self-management. Start at the end. Work your way back. Plan. Plan, as AJ said. Um, and it's all part of good mental health and good legal skills that you need to develop. So knowledge is therefore only one of the six threshold learning outcomes relevant to the study of law. So that is where I would naturally start to look to wrap up, even though we've got a whole lot more that we want to cover. But AJ, is there anything that we need to discuss? Uh, no. Um, if you wanted to stop the recording, um, I'm good with that. Um, I would say perhaps one final thought, and that is um, I think John's recommendation of looking at movies is a really great idea. And um, particularly start to try and wherever you're presented with a proposition, question it. Don't just accept it. And I would say the same with everything you read in your law degree. Don't just take it on board unquestioningly. Don't just, you know, zoom over a piece of reading with your highlighter and take it all as gospel truth. You know, examine everything. And I think that level of attention to detail is super important as you go through your degree. You know, question everything. Don't accept anything unless you're satisfied with it. And even then, be prepared to try and defend your position. And if you can, flip your proposition over in your mind and try and argue it from the other side. I think it's, it's a useful skill. That's just well, my conclusion. Well, thank you very much, AJ. And I will stop the recording. And uh, thank you very much for attending.